Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our LLB lecture series. This week, we have Jennifer Farr Davis here talking about her time on the trail and being a mom in a pandemic. So a little bit about Jennifer before we start. Jennifer knows what it takes to keep going. And as a hiker, she has covered over 14,000 miles and explored trails on six continents and in all 50 states. Jennifer has hiked the Appalachian Trail three separate times. In 2011, she set a record on this 2,190 mile pass by completing it in just 46 days. That's an average of 47 miles per day. That makes me tired just thinking about it. Nowadays, Jennifer spends most of her time hiking with her family or helping other people get on the trail throughout her business, Blue Ridge Hiking Company. And with a brief conversation before this, sounds like she's very busy with a four and eight year old at school all on the computer. I'm excited to welcome hiker, author, speaker, entrepreneur, National Geographic Adventurer of the Year, and a member of the Presidential Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition, Jennifer Farr Davis to our LL Bean Speaker Series. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Hey, Ashley, thanks so much for having me as part of the LL Bean Speaker Series. This is awesome. So we're gonna do a little bit of a rapid fire question thing. I wish this was something we've done for those who've attended our lectures in the past. This seems like a quick little get to know your presenter for those who don't know Jennifer. So Jennifer, what's your favorite trail food? Well, I eat a lot on the trail. I always say like my diet is gratitude because food <laughs> equals fuel. Um, but I am after hiking, you know, 14,000 miles, there's some things like I can't stand pop tarts. I <laughs> get really tired of energy bars, but I still love trail mix. Uh, I love kettle chips. And recently I've been taking dates and putting like a sharp cheese inside of that and then wrapping the date in pre-cooked bacon and popping those along the way. And that gives me a lot of energy and it tastes amazing. That sounds fantastic. I think I might have to try that one. So if you could hike with any celebrity, who would it be? I want to hike with Serena Williams. I grew up playing tennis and Serena and I are the same age. And the fact that she has been like a professional athlete for 20 years and she's still crushing it as a mom, like I admire her so much and I'm just intrigued by her. Like I would just love to talk to her and see what keeps her going. So Serena. Absolutely, that sounds great. So what is your favorite animal to see while you're out hiking? It's changed. I mean, in the beginning I was terrified of uh, bears and snakes still don't love snakes, but man, it makes my day to see a black bear. Like they are so graceful and um, clever and just cute. Like they really are cute right. from a safe distance. Yeah. Um, and then I love salamanders. Uh, we have so many different types of salamanders here. And it's one of those animals that you pass all the time and you don't even realize it. But when you slow down and you know, look at creeks or seepage areas or maybe peek under a rock. They're really everywhere and they're really great. That was one thing we noticed when I was on the AT in Vermont was just that little bit of a gem orange that you would see in the middle of kind of a dreary brown green day. And you're like, oh, mine's the newt. Don't step on it. Watch out. Here's a little piece of uh, a fairy tale, if you will. So um, do you listen to music while you hike? No, I never have. I mean, for me, it's partly a safety thing. Like I never want to plug both ears. It kind of drives me crazy when I walk up behind a hiker and I'm like, Hey, how are you? And then, like they I'm jump totally scared. Yeah, because <laughs> they haven't heard me. Um, but I just, uh, I don't know. I've gotten really into just listening to the sound of the forest. Like, it's not like it's quiet out there. Right. There's always noise or rustling or birds and that in its own way is just this beautiful soundtrack and it brings Absolutely. me like a lot of peace so that's that's what I like to listen to that's awesome so if you could hike in one new place right now where would it be oh man um it's weird I'm like should I suspend COVID or not <laughs> I guess I mean there's a lot of my husband and I have done quite a bit of international hikes and there's Still more places we'd love to go. I'd love to go to um, Chile and Argentina and hike down there. I'd love to go to the Himalayas someday. But I really, we live in the Southern Appalachians. We live in Asheville. And I have to say, during a time where we've all been focusing and hiking in our backyard, I am so grateful to live here. And there are so many wonderful places to explore in the area, um, especially in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So yeah, a lot of places I still want to go, but if I have to hang out in Western North Carolina for the rest of my life, I'd be pretty grateful for that too. 
I'm sure that a lot of our viewers are probably Mainers and they're probably having the same sentiment with, holy cow, I'm really grateful to be living in an area that has, you know, state parks and national park and just a lot of really great community lands around here, especially Freeport for those who are super local to us. So, all right. So we're gonna get into some of our longer based questions here. So our first question is, how did you get started with hiking? What was your passion around it? Yeah, well, like I mentioned earlier, I grew up playing tennis and basketball. So it wasn't like I was part of this outdoorsy family. Um, but when I graduated from college, I felt all this pressure to have the rest of my life figured out. Figured out. Yep. yep. And I didn't know like where I was gonna go or what I was gonna do or who I really was. and. I just wanted time and a place to think, you know, and try to figure things out. And so growing up in North Carolina, I had always heard of the Appalachian Trail, never set foot on it. And I had only spent two nights outdoors my entire life, but I had heard the trail was really long, like over 2000 miles. It would take five or six months to hike. It sounded super affordable. And I think in, you know, my 21 year old brain, I was like, hiking is just walking. Like how hard could it be? Right. So I scoop up my brother's little Boy Scout gear and then set off on my own from Georgia with the goal of walking all the way up to Maine. And of course it just kicks my butt, <laughs> which is what every 21 year old needs. Like it was the right? most humbling experience. And I made so many mistakes and I learned through those mistakes. People pointed out my mistakes. Like I was fit, but still hiking is just such a different type of intensity as far as a workout. And I remember mm -hmm. being out there, having my legs shaking, going down mountains and it was unrelenting. That was the thing that made it so hard is just um, how long it is. And I, I think back now, like, I remember this sense of pride I felt when I got out of Georgia, which is just like 77 miles, but it felt like it took forever <laughs> to yeah. get out of Georgia. And then I hit the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, which I had grown up an hour away from and never visited, like crazy. But I was excited to finally be there. And I um, have learned on the trail actually that the Great Smoky Mountain National Park is the most visited national park in the country. It gets more guests than the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or Yellowstone. And I was like, man, if all these people are coming to the Smokies, there has got to be something incredible to see. So I wanted the views and the wildlife and the wildflowers. And I got there and it was rain and it was fog <laughs> and it was mist and I was cold and I was wet and I was miserable. And my last night in the park, I pulled up to a trail shelter and I remember like rolling out my phone pad, crawling in my sleeping bag and just shivering, listening to the sound of rain fall on the shelter roof. Then the next morning I woke up and the first thought I had was like, oh, I don't hear the rain. And I get all excited because I think it stopped. And then I looked outside and this is where we're going to come across as like real Southern. <laughs> but I panicked because like everything was white. There's like eight inches of snow on oh, the ground no. coming down in blizzard light conditions. And like, I am almost out of food. I'm wearing all my clothes and I'm freezing. And now I'm in a blizzard. And I just think I've got to get out of here. And so I'm like packing up. My shoelaces are frozen with ice on them. Like my pack is all crusty with ice, but I get it all together. I start walking down the trail. And then I realize how um, the Appalachian Trail is really well marked, super well marked, you know, blazes on trees, blazes on rocks. And the one problem is with the color of those blazes the entire way from Maine to Georgia is white, which had not been hard to see until like that moment. And now, right. Like there's no fresh tracks. I can't find the trail. I'm really struggling to see blazes. But most of the time I was in the forest. So the trees kind of protected me from wind and snow. And then at one point I hit this exposed ridge line and now I felt like precipitation hitting my face and it just hurt. It stung. And so I duck my head and I shut my eye and I kept going as quickly as I could to get back inside the forest. And then I made it there and I lifted my chin and I couldn't open my eye because it had frozen. Oh, no. I know. And again, very Southern, right? So I'm like, I don't know what has happened to me. <laughs> and I had to stand there and like pick icicles off of my eyelashes and like crust from the corners of my eye until I could 
lift my eyelid and regain my sight and keep hiking down the mountain. And it's funny because I also remember <laughs> like I had this experience and I opened my eye and my first thought in that moment was like, you know, all this anxiety and stress and feeling lost and not being able to see. And I thought to myself, I just want to cry. Yeah. And then immediately I was like, but you can't cry. Don't do <laughs> right? it. Yeah. Free shot. Right. Um, but eventually, like after a really long day with several, several wrong turns, I got to the park boundary. There's a road, there's a hostel. I was safe. But the AT taught me so many lessons. And a big one from that experience was just that like my whole life, I'd really valued and prioritized hard work, which I still do. But the trail taught me that like vision and direction have to come first because there were so many times that day where I was giving like a hundred percent effort, but I was off trail. And so all my energy was making it harder, taking me farther away from where I actually wanted to be, where I actually wanted to go. And so mm -hmm. this really good wake up call of just like, if I want to do things in my life, like I've got to set a course, like I've got to think about it or make goals because that's where the energy should go. Otherwise all that energy could potentially take me like farther away from where I actually want to be. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great story. And it definitely shows a little bit of your Southern side, but I yeah. think a lot of Mainers on the trail hate that midsummer heat. I can do that. You know, and they, right. <laughs> a lot that. of us are like, no, no, you can keep all that Southern heat. No way. Yeah. I can drink right. the air, the humidity, the heat and humidity. <laughs> that oh. is like a warm hug that like wraps you up. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> that's all you wanted in that moment. Yeah, exactly. So in what made you want to set a record on the trail? It sounds like you've done it a couple times. You know, this first time wasn't your fastest time, kind of a learning experience, but yeah. What made you want to go back and set a record for it? Yeah, I know. I mean, records can even come across as like controversial because the trail inherently, I think is a very non-competitive environment. Um, but I do think the trail makes you question like what you're made of like consistently, mm -hmm. no, no matter what you're doing out there, it, it really just kind of shows you how you get through low times and how you work through challenges and hardship. Mm -hmm. And so after I had like a couple thousand miles of backpacking experience, because at first, I mean, again, like I didn't know if I was going to make it out of Georgia the first time, right? Yeah. So there was no thought of setting a record as I like got into this backpacking through hiking world. Um, but I always found myself like thinking I could give a little bit more when I finished a trail and just wondering like what that looked like. And, and then circumstantially life changed. I started my hiking company. I got married. I didn't have four to six months for the traditional super long trail. And my husband at that time, he was not a long distance hiker or backpacker when we met. He was like, this is your thing. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's cool. But just so you know, I'd really love to hike the AT one more time because it just was so important to me and changed my life. And so what we kind of came up with based off those factors is um, he was a school teacher and had the summers off. And I thought maybe I could hike the whole AT in two months. And by <laughs> doing that, I would establish a women's record, which at that time this is like 2008. There really wasn't a women's record on the trail. And, and part of this was this girl power moment of like, hey, I've heard about all these records. They're all being set by men. Like, why aren't women out there doing it? And so I went out with my husband's help and uh, we finished the trail. He would like meet me at road crossings, give me what I needed. We might hike a little together, or camp out together, but mostly I was on my own. And um, we did the trail in that fashion for 57 days. And we got to the end and established a women's record. And yeah, it was great. Um, it's also interesting because we got to the end and my husband, first of all, was like, we are never doing that again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other thing is, um, I thought it was this real girl power thing to be like, women should be setting records too. But I also realized by the time I got to the end that I had really limited myself from the beginning because I had put myself in this female category and I had made this record a lot like traditional sports where there's a men's grouping and a women's grouping. And since women are usually not as fast and strong, their performance can be deemed as like lesser than. And I had just told myself, I was like, well, you know, as a woman, I should finish about like 10 days behind the guys. 
And that's mm-hmm. exactly what I did. Cause my mind had made that decision before I gave my body a chance to show me what it could do. Mm-hmm. So, which leads into our next question. Why do it again? Because, um, <laughs> my husband let me No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Three years passed, like three years passed, um, from setting the women's record. And for a long time, I didn't think I would go back, but you know, my husband and I, we had started talking about trying to have a family and I'd mm-hmm. always like hoped I could be a mom, but I also knew that as soon as I got pregnant, if I was able to, like my time and my body would no longer be my own in the same way. Right. And with that realization, I just knew if I didn't go back and like find out what my best was, then I would always have regrets or questions. Right. I would so, always wonder. Yeah. Like I would always wonder. And, and so I was in this period, like pretty okay with failure, which is not a common place to be, I think in life. Like I don't love to fail, but I was just like, in that moment, like I need an answer. I don't care if I blow up mm-hmm. on trail, like right. if they look really bad. I got a ton of criticism when I told people I was going for the overall record. I mean, A, it's a whole competitive thing and B, um, they were like, you can't beat those guys. Like those guys win a hundred mile races and you've never won a 5k. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but I love the trail and I needed to know what my body could do basically. And so my husband agreed to help and we went out and it was so hard, <laughs> it was so, so hard. Um, and a lot of factors did not go in my favor early on. I got shin splints, which I think you have to expect some overuse injury, but then I had horrible weather in New Hampshire. And if there's one place like you really want some good weather, especially on a record attempt, it's New Hampshire. And I got slammed like late Mm -hmm. summer, rain, wind, sleet, snow, like all of it. And Mm -hmm. dealt with some hypothermia. And then I think because of that and all the stress on my body and the high mileage, days. I got really sick when I hit Vermont. So I basically quit. I tried to quit. Like I got to a road crossing. I was behind record pace. I felt horrible. I was struggling to go a mile per hour. And my husband was there and I was like, we're done. Not mm-hmm. you and me, but I'm like, mm-hmm. you're not, I'm but like you're done with the record. And all I wanted to do was go home. And I thought that, you know, that was all he wanted too. Like, I felt like he would be relieved, but instead he looked at me and said, if you really wanna quit, that's fine, but you can't quit right now. Because he said, right now you feel too bad to make a good decision. And so he gave me what I needed to keep going and said, if you wanna quit tomorrow, then I'll take you home. And I kept hiking, like determined to quit the next day, but eventually like medicine kicked in, I could hold in a little food and water And still no part of me thought I could set the record. Like I really believed it was not an option anymore, but I I started to, you know, think, well, maybe I can just stay out here. And then there was the question of like, well, am I out here for the record or to beat the guys? And then this voice really quickly was like, no, like it's not the most important thing to be the best. Like this is always, this trail has always really been about finding your best. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because I was working in this like record framework and then through like the pain and the hypothermia and the bad weather that was taken away. And I was brought back to this sense of like, I'm out here to see what I can do and what I'm made of. And it became very powerful because when I let go of the record, I realized how um, I think my performance was struggling because of the pressure and because of the constant focus on like numbers, miles per day, other people, the comparisons to other record setters. And it really was like I was running someone else's race and then letting go of that and waking up each day and just asking myself like, what's the best I can do today? That was so powerful. And it, you know, increased my miles, increased my enjoyment on the trail and ultimately like allowed us to finish in 46 days and at the time set the overall record. That's fantastic. In that, I mean, we're all living in that day to day, like what can I do? That's the best thing, you know, and we're, we're into this 10 months, you know, if you're speaking specifically to the pandemic, like how do we find that stressful situation and just do the best that we can? So that's fantastic. 
All right. So what does your life look like now? Post hiking, post all these major amazing things that you've accomplished. What does it look like day to day for you now? Yeah. Well, you really kind of summed it up with what you just said. Um, I mean, the trail is still a part of who I am and my soul. I think it always will be. And um, my husband and I, we give each other two weeks a year um, to hike away from family or work. Well, I hike. He sometimes has other adventures. Um, but that's been a really important way to like hold on to something that um, is a form of self-care and is really important mm-hmm. to us amid the pressure of work and supporting a family and raising children, um, which is what my life looks like. <laughs> but then you yeah. add COVID and, you know, I think the thing I've really been um, pondering or thinking through recently is when I did the record, like you pointed out, there were all these external comparisons that were toxic. And, Mm -hmm. and I learned sort of how to let those go and, and then focus on what I could do. And I think COVID has been different because I've realized that I can't compare myself to myself, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Like I keep thinking about what we were doing this time last year, or I look at our business numbers this time last year, or I look at like the opportunities my kids had this time last year or the amount Mm -hmm. of patience I had this time last year. And it's not the same and it's really easy to get down about it and frustrated. And um, I've really recently tried to say, okay, this this is a new reality where not only do I need to not compare myself to other people who have much different situations during COVID, Um, but I need to not compare myself to anything I was doing really last year and really try to just focus on doing the best that I can do in the, in the moment, because it really, it's, I mean, it's a day to day challenge very much still. And I think it will be for quite a while. So I'm grateful for the trail lessons. And then our saving grace as a family has been time outdoors, (laughs) like, oh yeah, looking looking for salamanders, taking hikes, camping out. We're actually yeah. hoping to um, plan a national parks sort of tour and camp out this summer because it is the place right now where we feel healthy and we feel whole and we feel our Definitely. most normal. So yeah, that's, that's sort of where we're at. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we're all given time here with LL Bean to get outside. We all know that it's It's really the one thing we all need right now with a lot of us working from home. And I'm sure you can equate that with your family and little kids too. They're, they're cooped up with school. They're just kind of over it at some point, you know, a lot of screen time, like we talked about before, people are just totally consumed with screen time right now with our work and with our play and all that. So getting outside can really just get you that reprieve that we all need from our lives. I agree. And just like, um, you know, the vaccine now is so important in treating COVID and COVID has taken so much attention for the past year, but the side effects also, which I don't feel like have been addressed as much, but we, you know, as a nation and society right now, so many of us are struggling with like health and wellness, mental health, you know, there's Mm -hmm. higher cases of, of depression and substance abuse and I know there's a lot of tools to help treat those things. I just don't know that any of them are more affordable or accessible than just going outdoors. And so oh, I think absolutely. it's a really yeah. important message right now to say like, here's one thing you can do right now that might help. Um, mm-hmm. So it's been nice to like have this love for the outdoors, this deep passion for it for, you know, 15, 16 years and then get to this year and be like, no, I really meant it. Like, I mean it more. Right. Like, we all, like, I thought it was important. It's like life-saving important. Right. We all need to do that. Um, You're like, I told you so. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is, that is my hope. My hope is America can find a lot of healing through this journey of divisiveness and isolation through spending time outside. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jennifer. We really appreciate it. And Hopefully we can all be released into the outdoors and you guys can have your national parks trip here very soon. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, L.L. Bean. And we'll definitely see you the next time we are up in Maine. Sounds good. Thanks, Jennifer.